It's been one year since the coronavirus pandemic upended life across the globe. Today's guest reminds us that behind the headlines and beyond the statistics, there are stories of individual lives interrupted and all too often cut short. He's Dan Barry this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to a Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me, as always, is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Each week, we talk about big issues with great guests, authors, journalists, scholars, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. This week, we're joined by one of America's great storytellers, a longtime reporter and columnist for the New York Times, and the author of several books. He's also the 2018 recipient of the Pell Center Prize for Story in the Public Square. Dan Barry, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Jim. Dan, you know, we, you are uh, one of our favorite storytellers, one of our favorite journalists. Um, it's been great every time we've had you on, but we wanted to spend some time today as we look back on the last year and life in the pandemic and hear a little bit about the stories that you've reported on and and the stories that you've shared uh, in, in the Times. But I wonder if we could begin, though, with just sort of uh, on, on a more personal level, how has reporting in the midst of the pandemic changed for you? It's been um, an entire upheaval of, of how I've been trained to do my job. Um, generally, what you want to do, and Wayne would agree, I think, with this, is to bear witness to be there, to be in the moment, uh, not only to see the surroundings and the settings of the stories you're writing about, but also to uh, be in the presence of the people you're writing about. Uh, that fosters a, um, a, an understanding, if not a trust, that you you hope to uh, achieve as a, as a journalist. And a lot of that has been denied us uh, because a lot of the reporting now has to be done virtually. Uh, so. Uh, we've tried to overcome it. I've tried to bear witness when I could uh, without too much risk to my own health or to the risk of others. Um, but um, I would say that most journalists working uh, in 2020 and now into 2021 would say that their challenges have been increased uh, tenfold by uh, this pandemic. Well, one of the stories that uh, so resonated with us was a, a deep dive that you and some of your colleagues at the Times did into the epicenter, uh, which is the name of the of the of the article uh, in Queens uh, as the as the pandemic ramped up in the spring of 2020. Can you tell us just a little bit a broad overview of what that story is and and how you told it? Uh, sure. So um, this. Uh, swath of Queens is uh, very heavily populated and it's also astoundingly and wonderfully diverse. Um, the demographers are still trying to count the numbers of languages and dialects that is being spoken in these contiguous neighborhoods of uh, Elm, Elmwood, uh, I'm sorry, Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, Corona, Woodside. And so it's an extraordinary um, piece of the United States, if not the world. And so uh, the uh, housing conditions are fairly difficult there. And also a lot of the people who work there are uh, new to the country and um, not always documented. So there's all sorts of uh, accommodations and compromises being made in terms of uh, where they live and how they live. O oftentimes uh, apartments are being subdivided and uh, there are say, 12 people not related living in one apartment. So this was a perfect uh, setting, in fact, for the spread of the coronavirus, as we know. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, residents in these neighborhoods were uh, in the service industry. They were the ones that effectively were holding up the city while the rest of us 
uh, stayed in our homes and our apartments. They were the ones who went to work. Um, so that created a situation where the virus uh, really took hold. And um, th at the center of this, these neighborhoods is uh, Elmhurst Hospital. And uh, as you could predict, uh, they were overwhelmed. And so what the story tried to do was follow several people um, as they um, um, wandered through this terrain, this pandemic terrain. And we tried to structure it based on John Hersey's Hiroshima, and I hope a lot of your viewers uh, are at least familiar, if not have read that great work, where it's really bearing witness, isn't it? And, and going back and telling the stories of people. So we followed several people. Uh, sadly, not all of them survived, but we were able to recreate their journey um, through lots of interviews and lots of reporting. That was so, actually one of, one of my quick questions about that was, were, was the story contemporaneously reported or was it, was it all retrospective? Right, so I, a little of both. So um, it was, I think, in um, maybe late April uh, or early May, I think it was late April when I proposed this to one of my editors that we try to revisit what happened in Elmhurst and Woodside and Corona um, in late March and early April? Because if you remember, there was the uh, event in Washington State at a nursing home. And then even then, I think a lot of us, particularly in the East Coast, felt like, well, that's still distant. It's still not real. There was a, there was a, a suspension of disbelief here, wasn't there? And so when it hit Queens in late March, um, and it came out that uh, that Elmhurst Hospital had had 13 deaths within 24 hours. Suddenly, I think the pandemic became real, not only for New York, but for the entire country. So, Dan, as you'll recall, I was in New York City at the end of February for Toy Fair. Uh, there was al already some, some word on the street. You know, there was sort of a feeling that, that something bad was about to happen. And then, of course, something really bad happened. I want to get into or get have you get into the genesis of the pro of the project, um, and you mentioned this. You, you told Chip Scanlon, writing for the Neiman Foundation, that in mid April, and I'm going to read this now. You and, and the Metro editor was Cliff Levy. We're trying right. to figure out how to capture the enormity of what was occurring, wave after wave of relentless news, the pandemic, the presidential campaign, racial justice demands, and more. Left newsrooms little time. To process one event before another swept in. Talk about that period. I mean, I, I think obviously journalists and readers and people remember that it was just it was a tsunami that just hit. Talk about talk about that. Sure, I, I think we could all remember that time. Um, it seemed like life was going by so quickly, and there were so many things going on that none of us could pause to to digest. Even one of those episodes, I mean, it was on the heels of the impeachment process. Um, there were so many things going on and um, I'm a true believer in going back. Okay. So the New York times, like a lot of other media outlets did very good and quick stories about those moments in say Queens. So there were stories about the 13 deaths. There were stories about. Uh, the doctors and nurses being overwhelmed, and there were stories about the funeral homes not able to keep up with the uh, the dead, quite frankly. But um, uh, Cliff and I spoke uh, at length about, well, what do we do here? And I, I felt strongly that um, it becomes more meaningful and we are able to process it more if we go back and as uh, our editor, Tom Heslin at the Providence Journal said, and I've said it many times, slow it down, slow it down. So that the people that we're writing about are not statistics. That as you follow Jamel Alvarado through her journey, you know her, you feel for her, you understand where she's coming from. And when she sadly dies, you feel that loss, right? So that's that was the intent to go back and and try to determine, say, a one week span or a two week span. It wound up being about two weeks. We didn't know at the very beginning to 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 uh, say, OK, within these two weeks, here is this piece of geography. Here are these characters. Let's see them wander through this 
uh, period and how do they do and who comes out on the other side and getting, getting back to your question, Jim. So there was, there was a lot of going back and recreating with also text messages, photographs, and really intense uh, interviews by phone, but also in person. So we, uh, Annie Coriel and I went back to these neighborhoods and did in-person interviews. In addition, I, I went into the hospital and um, slowed it down. And, and you had a photographer on your team too, uh, Todd Heisler, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Right. How did you find these characters? And there are a number of them, and I, I think we'll get into a few uh, a little later in the show. But how did you find them? I mean, they're, you're looking at a, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of people from which to choose. You know, we we um, knocked on doors. Um, uh, Annie, in particular, knocked on a lot of doors. We knew that we wanted to focus on certain uh, communities that were particularly hit. Uh, so the Bangladesh community was hit very hard. Um, a lot of uh, 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 Bangladesh uh, drive Uber or taxi cabs, and that industry was hit um, significantly. Uh, we we knew that um, uh, there was a disproportionate uh, number of people of color who were being hit, so we wanted to focus on that. We knew that we wanted to focus at least on one person in the healthcare world at Elmhurst Hospital. Um, who could represent the hospital, and we found Dr. Laura Iavacoli. Um, so it was also checking, uh, quite frankly, death notices, uh, checking Facebook pages, um, and listening to the community, and you would hear these names, Jamel Alvarado, uh, Dawa Sherpa. You know, think about that, uh, how extraordinary this is. Um, here's a guy from the Himalayas, you know, who comes from the Sherpa community and and he winds up uh, becoming infected as an Uber driver and then comes out the other side, he, he, he survives. So there was a lot of uh, background work and a lot of characters that we had narrowed down and, and chosen as possible characters. And then we settled on these six, knowing that the reader could only take characters to follow. Yeah, Dan, one of the things that emerges is, is this incredibly rich tapestry of, of this section of Queens and, and the international voices and the immigrant, the lived immigrant experience there. I wonder, though, there were times where um, they seemed to express disbelief almost that this could happen in the United States. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, I, I yes, um, <clears throat> I think that uh, the disbelief was, um, well, first, there's a disbelief that we're, in fact, living in a pandemic. I think even as I speak to you now, uh, I can't believe that I've been in my house pretty much uh, uh, for a year now or nearly a year. Um, and my family has been in the house and we, we haven't seen friends and family. Uh, so there's that disbelief that was shared by everybody in New York, if not around the world, right? So then uh, when it hits, the disbelief comes in thinking that no one is hearing, no one is living, okay? That there's a disconnect between the services they think that they would receive in the United States or in New York and, and uh, uh, what's happening on the ground. And so the disbelief would be, Jim, um, standing outside in the cold and rain in late March, um, uh, outside of a tent, hoping to get tested to see whether you have the virus and whether you would be admitted into the hospital. And so that line would go around a city block. Um, that's where the disbelief would be, I think. And also, um, uh, imagine, imagine if um, the three of us live together, we're not related, and one of us gets sick. How do you, in a small New York apartment, a one-bedroom apartment, how do you navigate life there? You're supposed to be socially distancing. How do, you, how do you do that? You can't do that. And that was also one of the problems. So the disbelief was in the lived experience writ large. Did you have any concerns for your own health and well-being? I mean, much of this was reconstruction, but some of it was also on the ground reporting. So you went into the community, you and your colleagues. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk about that. I mean, you were taking a risk, clearly. Right. And that was uh, that was heavy on my mind. But 
Uh, first of all, I don't want to sound like, oh, how heroic I went to Queens uh, in, in the spring and summer or that I went into the hospital um, and spent a day there. Uh, first, we had plenty of uh, PPE uh, and, um, you know, I want to say that the frontline workers deserve all the credit. Uh, you know, some hack who happened to, you know, dip in and out of the community in the hospital doesn't deserve any kind of sympathy. But what, what we did was we were fully aware of the situation. We were, wore masks. We wore PPE. When we were in the hospital, we wore effectively the hazmat suit. And then when we would come home, you know, I did this multiple times. You come home. <laughs> You take your clothes off outside, uh, much to the chagrin of your neighbors, and uh, <laughs> and you throw that stuff in the corner, and you run and take a shower, and then you uh, then you um, you don't burn your clothes, but you you wash your clothes and um, you do it again. And and what I did, you know, a, a couple of dozen times, other people were doing daily for months. Do you know what I mean? And and at much closer contact. Uh, to people with uh, the virus. So the reporting is done. Uh, and, I, you know, we were communicating over the summer and, and early fall, and you were saying you were working on a project and, and you didn't say what it was, obviously it was this, and you were saying it, it was a lot of work and so forth. It turned out to be over 11,000 words long. And, and by the way, every one of those words is put together beautifully as as we would expect. Thank you. From you. But how did you put it together? <laughs> How'd you do it? All right, Let's, like, what's the magic here? Eleven thousand words, and, and it, it just sings, you know, and it sings mournfully sometimes, often. How, how did you put all that together? Well, uh, I ingested a lot of hallucinogens. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, um, it, it it was it was difficult to wrestle down and to. Not what we didn't want to do, Wayne, and, and you would know this as a, as 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 a, a star of the craft. Um, we didn't want um, self-contained anecdotes that strung together, you know. So here's Dan Barry, here's Jim Lutis, here's Wayne Miller. We wanted it to be seamless, so that the the characters are kind of what well, you could almost imagine them passing one another on the street. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, when I heard the story, uh, Annie Coriel did a lot of the work on Jamel Alvarado, the, the, the uh, cabaret singer. And, you know, you, you look at all your material. My office was a mess. We're, we're saying, OK, how do we begin? And what happens is you relax and what story rises to the top? And I just imagined this 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 woman uh, singing in a in a nightclub. Um, um, she's actually um, uh, miming the words, uh, and almost no one is there, and she's not feeling well, and it's before you know we, we realize what's what, how how dire the situation would be at the time that she's on the stage on a Monday night in Queens, right? There's still plans for the St. Patrick's Day parade. There's still things going on. New Rochelle had just been put in lockdown or was about to be put on lockdown, but the rest of us were still planning to go on with our usual uh, routines, if you recall. And here's this woman and she doesn't feel well. And so now we have a beginning and then you have to have, well, where are we? And uh, that's where you, you have the, the crazy scrum of life, the, the richness of life underneath the elevated train, uh, the seven train in Queens. And then, and then what happens is it becomes chronological. We had a we had a, 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 a spreadsheet or a Google Doc that had like, okay, what happened on this day? What happened on this day? And it was filled with tons and tons of material. What Mario? What what? I'm sorry. What Governor Cuomo was saying? What President Trump was saying? What the CDC was saying? What Mayor De Blasio was saying? And then, you know, on the ground level, what was Maria Chaudhuri doing on that day? Uh, what was Dawa Sherpa doing on that day? And then, then, then we we you know you, if you read it, it's almost chronological. But that's how it was. And we knew, lastly, that it, it we couldn't end with, you know, uh, uh, a death. It had to there had to be some kind of 
resurrection or redemption. And when they have the uh, memorial service for Jamil Alvarado in July, and it's hot, and people are drinking shots of tequila and singing, to me, there was something wonderful about that, about resilience, about determination to survive. So you mentioned the beginning, and I'm just going to read the very beginning of this incredible narrative. And for those in our audience who haven't read the epicenter, I, I highly recommend you do it. I know a lot of our audience members have read it, but let me just read it. This is such a Dan Barry opening. She wears a red wig and a black dress. She sewed herself. It hugs her body as she moves about the stage, lip syncing love songs in Spanish to a room filled mostly with absence. I mean, from there on, uh, you just you're drawn in and, and 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 let me let me switch here now to the online presentation that that was another wonder you know with the maps the aerial views and what role did you play in bringing that together um you know some i mean it's you know all credit due to the graphics department and to the editor of this uh project uh kirsten danis uh who's from new england um uh with the graphics you know it, all along uh, Wayne, uh, I just imagined, you know, the God's view of a slice of the world, and this slice happened to be uh, Queens, where the entire world is represented in its people. And I just imagined looking down, and you could see the seven train, and you could see, oh, that's that's Corona over there. There's the funeral home. Uh, this is where Dawa Sherpa lives. Uh, he lived very close to Jack Wongsarat, the, the Thai chef who um who who became sick and and just say okay here's a mile you know a half mile uh 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 wide and maybe a mile long a little more and look at it and then plot out the maps that's what we were trying to do hey dan you mentioned uh sort of the the pronouncements coming from the white house in that time frame and you know, I, I can't help but think back to just sort of the stark contrast between some of the, the rosy pronouncements that, that we heard from the, the briefing room in the White House to the lived experience that you encountered in reporting this story. I, I, I don't want to ask this as a necessarily partisan question, but I'm wondering, did you get a sense of, of, of people's reaction, uh, their sense of what they were hearing and how disconnected it was from the experience they were in the midst of? Uh, I, I would say that what was coming out of the White House had no meaning or, or uh, uh, attraction in their lives and in, in the lived experiences. And, you know, the president uh, grew up about six miles from here. That's also an interesting aspect of how we live, that uh, he grew up in a fairly exclusive neighborhood that, that it's a 10 minute drive from say Elmhurst Hospital. Um, and if you remember uh, the president at that time was saying, you know, we're gonna get past this, everything's fine, it's not that bad. And then when the, 22, when the 13 deaths were reported out of Elmhurst Hospital, he saw some video of the black body bags and the trucks. And he kind of like, I, I don't wanna say, he, he marveled at it, let's say that. He marveled at those images, but, that, that's as far as it went. I don't think that uh, his reaction uh, or his uh, his sense of uh, coming from this neighborhood changed anything for the uh, Jamil Alvarado's of the world at all. So you've managed to write other stories during the pandemic you have and continue to. Uh, and I want to mention one and maybe we'll get to more than one, but this one really this one really moved me. It was emotional as much of your storytelling is, and it was titled 92 Years Old and Pleading to Come Home. It's about a man, Joseph Trinity, who was in a rehab center at the start of the pandemic when visitors were not allowed. Tell us about that story, and then, and then the ending, which <laughs> still, get, I'm just thinking about it, gives me chills. Tell us about the story, and then give us the ending. Sure, and I think a lot of your... Um your audience will identify with this. Um, having a loved one, uh, an older loved one in a, a facility, whether it's a nursing home or rehab facility or a hospital, and then there's the, uh, the onset of the pandemic and suddenly there's a lockdown, okay? So uh, Joe Trinity was uh, a public school teacher in Springfield, New Jersey, much beloved. He was uh, 
he, he, he was a theater uh, uh, and drama teacher, and he led a lot of productions over the years, The Music Man, The Crucible, that kind of thing. And um, now he's in his early 90s, and he had had a setback. Uh, he had fallen. And so he was in a rehab facility, and you knew that they were going to lock everything down. And if they locked everything down, no one would be able to visit him. And already there were restrictions. Um, the family couldn't get into the rehab facility already. You know, uh, it was unclear. And then suddenly there was a lockdown. And so now the family has um, a difficult decision to make, doesn't it? Right? Uh, leave, leave their loved one in this rehab facility where you know the virus is going to spread, right? You just know it. Or Bring that. Bring their loved one home. Ninety-two-year-old man who who has um, who has great uh, medical and physical needs, and try to patch together some kind of care for him at his home, the home that he has owned for sixty years. And so the well, thirty you know, seconds, Dan. All right, and and ultimately uh, uh, the family had to make that decision, and it was to bring him home and to set up the the kitchen and the living room as basically a healthcare in a healthcare setting. And uh, he's now 93, and he's my father-in-law, Joe Trinity. That's amazing. An amazing story. Uh, Dan, we could spend all week talking to you. We thank you for taking the time, and we thank you for sharing these stories with us. He's Dan Barry with the New York Times. If you're not following him, you should be. Uh, that's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit pelsener.org, where you can always catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.